Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week on the Vatican and Global Catholic Church beat, looking for those few precious sweet fruits that will serve up a nourishing meal. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with liftoff to Lithuania. Rumors currently suggest that Pope Francis may be on the verge of sending German Archbishop Georg Gainswein to the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia as his nuncio, that is, his ambassador, will examine a couple of structural reasons why making your problem child your envoy might merit a second thought. Second, on the road again, the Vatican announces a ambitious trip for Pope Francis in early September to Asia and Oceania. From the 2nd to the 13th of September, Pope Francis is scheduled to visit Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, East Timor, and finally Singapore. Assuming this trip happens, we'll explain why it will have significance on multiple levels. Third, of cloisters and courtrooms, a French nun takes the Vatican to court, claiming that she was fired without cause from her gig as the leader of a small community of Dominican nuns in the Brittany region of France. She actually won at the lower court level, triggering vociferous protests from the Vatican about both sovereign immunity and religious freedom. We'll unpack what's going on in that case. Fourth up this week, we've got polling about the Pope. The latest public opinion survey in the United States indicates that Pope Francis's broad support among American Catholics continues to be robust, but Surprise, surprise, opinion is highly diversified based upon partisan preference. That is, if you are a self-described Democrat and a Catholic, you're much more likely to like this pope than if you're a self-described Republican and a Catholic. We'll dig into the numbers and tell you what they tell us. And then finally this week, we've got banned in Kinshasa. Congo Catholics are upset that their cardinal was turned away from the VIP lounge in the local airport, we'll explain how that seemingly fairly minor incident might actually have big political and diplomatic significance. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's show, so please don't go anywhere because I will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are, they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. (laughs) 
All right, everybody, welcome back. Happy Wednesday to you. Happy Wednesday, April 17th in the year of our Lord, 2024. If you're watching this show in the United States, that means you survived tax day. I hope you came through it reasonably unscathed. If you're watching it anywhere else, I hope you're enjoying a beautiful and blessed spring. We begin this week with lift off to Lithuania. So, as we all know, and we've discussed several times on this program, German Archbishop Georg Gainswein, who was the closest aide to the late Pope Benedict XVI, has emerged as a kind of bet noir for the Francis papacy, kind of public enemy number one, if you like. There, it was well known while Benedict was still alive that there were tensions between some of the circles around Pope Francis and some of the circles around Pope Benedict. There was a perception that Gainswine was to some extent responsible for stoking some of those tensions. But this all really came to a head when Pope Benedict died and Gainswine released an interview book called in Italian, Niente altro che la verità, meaning nothing but the truth, in which he sort of dished about the fractures and the fault lines between the previous pope and the current one over issues such as the Latin Mass and on and on. Also complained about how Pope Francis had essentially decapitated Gainswine himself, that is, firing him, in effect, as the prefect of the papal household, that is, allowing him to keep the title, but telling him, you shouldn't come to work anymore because I don't want you around. Now, all of this created a situation in which, after the death of Benedict, Pope Francis decided that he didn't want Gainswine in the Vatican anymore, so he sent him packing back to Germany, but gave him no new job. So he became the most famous unemployed Catholic bishop in the world. Now, flash forward to another new interview book, this one with Pope Francis, called El Sucesor, in Spanish, The Successor. It's an interview book with a Spanish journalist, Javier Martinez Brocol, about the relationship between Benedict and Pope Francis. In this book, Pope Francis himself dished a little bit about some of his own resentments with regard to the way that relationship played out, and suggested that the decision to publish a book right after Benedict died, in which there were some negative things said about Francis, and that obviously was a decision in which Gainswine was involved, Pope Francis said that decision lacked what he described as nobility and humanity. This was considered kind of a slam on Gainswine. All that brings us to the past week. We have this clear rift between these two men, the Pope and the figure most closely identified with the previous Pope, Rumors now suggest that Pope Francis may want to extend some kind of olive branch to Gainswine, and the hypothesis is that he may do so by naming him his nuncio, that is, his ambassador to the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, a job that is currently open because the guy, the archbishop who had it before, just recently got named the papal nuncio to Italy and the Serenissima Republic of San Marino. So. The idea here being this, this would be a kind of kiss and make up exercise. However, two things to think about in terms of the wisdom of such a move. First, when one country sends an ambassador to another, the country that is receiving the ambassador, what they really care about is whether that envoy has juice with the administration he or she has to represent. In other words, do they have access to the boss? So that when, when the foreign ministry calls up the ambassador and says, I need your president or your prime minister to do X, do they have a reasonable basis to believe that the ambassador can make that happen? If it looks like the head of state is simply offloading somebody they don't trust and don't like and trying to get them out of the way, the country receiving that ambassador is going to feel insulted and the ambassador him or herself is going to be hobbled from the beginning by perceptions that they don't have access to the person in charge. Okay, so that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is what does this do to the esprit de corps of Vatican nuncios? I mean, papal ambassadors around the world like to think that their job matters. The perception that the Pope is using it as a kind of garbage dump 
pardon the expression, but nevertheless, you know, what the Italians would call a parcheggio, a, a parking spot, simply to get someone out of the way, is not exactly the highest praise, I suppose, that a pope could give in terms of his assessment of how important this rule actually is. And there might be some consequences there down the line. Now, whether this is actually going to happen and you know, how Gainswine will acquit himself from the rule, should it come to pass, all that remains to be seen. But nevertheless, it would suggest that if Pope Francis is going to do this, he might want to find ways to reassure both the Baltic states and his own ambassadorial corps that this is not a slight but instead, it is an opportunity. All right, second up this week, we have On the Road Again. The Vatican announced this week that Pope Francis is going to be taking a lengthy and demanding international trip in early September. The dates are September 2nd through the 13th. He will be going to Indonesia. He will follow that with a stop in Papua New Guinea. Then he will visit East Timor, and he will end up in Singapore before coming back to Rome. Now, what's the significance of this trip? Well, let's start with the obvious. This is a pope who most recently, during Holy Week, obviously seemed to be struggling against his physical limits. He had to sit out the traditional Good Friday Via Crucis procession. That is, he didn't go in the end to Rome's Colosseum. He followed it on a kind of closed circuit TV hookup from his residence in the Vatican. He skipped his Palm Sunday homily, wasn't able to deliver it because he was continuing to battle respiratory difficulties related to a couple of bouts with bronchitis. This is on top of the fact that he has had a number of other maladies that have limited him to a wheelchair or the use of a cane that have made it difficult for him to speak in public, made it difficult for him to move. So the fact that despite all of that, he has been willing to publicly commit to making a very demanding and lengthy overseas trip is a kind of clear statement on his part and on the part of his Vatican handlers that whatever the Pope's difficulties may be, this is not a man who is on death's door. Despite his struggles, he is continuing to move full steam ahead. Now, I mean, it remains to be seen what sort of accommodations will be made for the 87-year-old pontiff on this trip. We would imagine that there will have to be some sort of, you know, trimming around the edges. That is, perhaps, you know, when he lands, his first day in Indonesia will be empty so he can rest up. They'll probably try to limit his movements, limit his public exposure. Perhaps he will give fewer public addresses or ask other people to deliver at least some of those addresses in his name. We will see. Nevertheless, the fact that he is committed to going is an important statement about the Pope's resilience. And if he is, in fact, able to go, that is, if they don't have to pull out at the last minute because of some late-breaking health difficulty, if he makes this trip, I think it would be a clear sign that this is a Pope who has some gas left in the tank. Bear in mind, it's a bit dicey because later in September, he is supposed to go to Belgium for a weekend trip, and then in October, He's scheduled to preside over the denouement of his Senate of Bishops on Synodality here in Rome. So it is a fairly dicey sort of high wire act that the Pope is undertaking. Nevertheless, he obviously feels up to it. You know, assuming he goes, this trip will be significant for at least three reasons. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim nation. But, of course, it's not part of the Arab world. It's an opportunity for Pope Francis to reach out to that vast constellation of Islam that is not conditioned by the culture and the politics of the Arab world. Indonesia typically has a reputation as a very tolerant and moderate society, although there are jihadist tendencies in some parts of the country. So it will be important to the Pope in terms of his larger effort to reach out to global Islam. His trip to East Timor is very important because it is one of the few majority Catholic countries in Asia. It's really it in the Philippines, and of course, East Timor is much smaller. But nevertheless, pastorally, the presence of the Pope there will be very important. And in Singapore, really all throughout Asia, but in Singapore particularly, it's a platform for the Pope not simply to engage 
the country itself, but also to engage China, because Singapore is a culturally, economically, politically, it's an important interlocutor for China. And so it's an opportunity for the Pope to get a message across, not simply to his host nations, but also to the superpower just across the fence line that is obviously going to be paying very close attention. Let me add, by the way, apropos of, of Papua New Guinea, that I was educated by the Capuchin Franciscans out in the high plains of Western Kansas. And since the 1950s, they have had a mission in Papua New Guinea. In fact, when I was a young man in grade school, St. Joseph's Elementary in Hayes, Kansas, I was often encouraged to pray for the Capuchin missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And so I am very hopeful when the Pope is actually in the country, he can give a shout out to some of my boys in the OFM Caps who for the last half century have been doing God's work in what is, by all accounts, a fairly difficult assignment. All right, third up this week, we've got of cloisters and courtrooms. So there is a small community of nuns called the Institute of the Dominican Sisters of the Holy Spirit. Numbers about 100 sisters. They run five schools. They're located in the Brittany region of Western France. and. In 2020, the Vatican dispatched Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette, who at the time was still head of its very powerful Congregation for Bishops, to conduct an apostolic visitation of this small community, the conclusion of which was that the Mother Superior, whose religious name was Mother Marie Ferriol, whose given name is Sabine Baldan de la Vallette, but for our purposes here, let's just call her Mother Marie, okay? The conclusion of this visitation was that Mother Marie was to be removed. And so she was removed and expelled from the community. Now, in principle, to be honest, there's nothing particularly unusual about this. These sorts of apostolic visitations of religious orders go on all the time. Quite often, they end in somebody being suspended or removed or whatever. What makes this story slightly different, however, is that Mother Marie decided but she was not going to go quietly into that good night. She was not going to go down without a fight. Instead, she got a civil lawyer and she sued in a French civil court under French labor laws for wrongful termination, among other things. She claimed that she had never been told the reason for which she was being removed. She argued that she was not given the right to defend herself, so you know her due process rights were violated. And further, she also argued that she was given no compensation, no severance package, if you like, so that when she was kicked out of the religious order, she basically had to go on the French equivalent of welfare in order to support herself. A lower court in a municipality near the convent where she had been the mother superior heard this case, and in mid-April, it rendered its verdict. And it found in favor of Mother Marie, basically saying, concluding, the judge concluded that she had been wrongfully dismissed from this order, that her rights had been violated. Not only that, he actually cited Ouellette and two other officials who were involved in this apostolic visitation and assigned them roughly $215,000 in damages and fines for violation of French labor statutes. It is believed to be the first time that a French court has rendered such a verdict. Obviously, this did not sit well with the Vatican. A statement put out by the Vatican spokesman, Italian layman Matteo Bruni, indicated first that Cardinal Willette had not been served with any notice of this verdict. He didn't even know, apparently, that a case was underway. And so the, the claim there is that he was not given an opportunity to respond. Second, Bruni's statement indicated that there are issues here with sovereign immunity. Remember that the Holy See is a sovereign entity under international law and generally, therefore, enjoys immunity from being judged by the courts of a country with which it has diplomatic relations. And third, this Bruni statement also indicated that this case raises deep and profound questions about religious freedom that is, the ability of a religious entity in France in order to control its own internal life, and also about the right of free association of Catholic faithful. 
in France. The community to which Mother Marie belonged has indicated that it is going to, it has launched an appeal to an appellate court that will hear the case and look over the verdict. The community argued that the lower court judge made a number of errors of fact and law in reaching his judgment. In terms of what the backstory here is, as I say, this is a relatively small order. We're talking about 100 nuns, runs about five schools. Apparently in 2011, between 2011 and 2014, it had been the subject of controversy because there was a, a chaplain at the time who was into something called agape therapy, which is a kind of somewhat odd mix of, of psychology and spirituality. Some people had found it sort of prone to abuse. Among other things, he was apparently conducting exorcisms on a fairly regular basis. The French bishops denounced the practice. There was a visitation at that time, which resulted in this chaplain and some of the nuns who were most associated with what he was doing being removed. And you would think, problem solved. But instead, what that left was one part of this community that wanted to go back to its roots, which were in a very traditional kind of pre-Vatican II Latin mass Catholicism, and another part of the community that felt that scandal was a sort of warning sign that they needed to modernize and adopt some of the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. By all accounts, Mother Marie was associated with the more traditionalist camp within the order. No great surprise, I suppose, that under the Francis papacy, that is often not the constituency that is looked upon with favor. And so she was removed. Obviously, we were going to have to see what the appellate court here does and whether the French government, as a result of the Vatican's appeals, decides to get involved. But I suppose the big picture here is it shows an increasing willingness on the part of civil courts across much of the Western world not to give, not to show the traditional deference to the Vatican and to the Catholic Church that it did once upon a time, an increasing willingness to look at the Catholic Church as just another NGO, just another business, just another organization on its soil, and to subject them to the same legal standards as everybody else. How that plays out, obviously, remains to be seen. All right, fourth up this week, we have polling about the Pope. So the Pew Survey, America's most important sort of think tank about religion, recently released the results of its latest survey of American Catholic opinion with regard to Pope Francis. And the, the top line here would be, the Pope's support is down a little bit, but still remains basically strong. It found that Pope Francis has overall a 75% approval rating from American Catholics. Now, that is down from the last survey in 2021, which found that he had an 83% approval rating, so he has lost eight points. But look, folks, 75% is still a very good number. Go ask Joe Biden or Donald Trump if they would take a 75% approval rating right now, since they both have approval ratings south of 50%. I think they would tell you they would run screaming into the night if they could get a number like that. And, you know, the, the big picture here is in the media, there is this narrative sometimes that it's the American Catholic Church versus Pope Francis, right? You've got the liberal Latin American as the Pope and the conservative stick in the mud American church that is trying to sandbag him at every turn. What this poll and many other polls like it would suggest is the narrative that the American Catholic Church toot court is in some kind of open rebellion against Pope Francis is just silly. That's not how Americans rule. You know, John Paul II got 90% approval ratings from American Catholics. Benedict XVI, at his worst, had numbers in the high 60s, low 70s, and generally polled in the 80s. You know, Francis is in the 70s to the 80s. American Catholics like popes, left, right, and center, the default setting of American Catholics is to support the Pope, okay? Now, what this poll further suggested, however, is that that overall 75% approval rating masks a sharp partisan contrast when you dial down. What we find is that of Catholics who identify themselves as Democrats, 89%, that's basically nine in 10, give Pope Francis a thumbs up. Catholics who identify as Republicans only 63%, six in 10, 
say they approve of Pope Francis. To flip that around, let's look at his, his disapproval numbers. Among self-identified Democrats, only 7%, 7 say they disapprove of Pope Francis. 35% of self-identified Republicans say that they disapprove of Pope Francis. So what this tells us, and frankly, you would have to have been living under a rock for the last couple of decades to miss this point, but American society generally is a deeply polarized landscape, and the American Catholic Church, which is somewhere between 20 and 25% of the American population, is basically a faithful mirror of that broader reality. That is, it too is broadly polarized. Now, what the Pew survey also found is that on contentious issues in the church, such as birth control, women priests, married priests, gay marriage, that generally speaking, among self-identified Catholics, there is a kind of narrow majority that would like to see the church change on many of these issues. Often it breaks 60-40, somewhere in that neighborhood. But once again, drilling down, there is also a dramatic gap between Catholics who may check the Catholic box on a census form, but don't actually participate in the life of the church, and those who attend Mass at least once a week. Among weekly Mass goers, support for all of those reforms is substantially lower than it is in the general Catholic population. It gets closer to 50-50, or in some cases, there's a 55-45% break against one of these proposed reforms. All of which really should come as no big surprise to us. I mean, what it tells us is that American Catholics are like Americans generally. Their attitudes towards public figures and their attitudes towards issues are heavily conditioned by their ideological preferences. And yes, that probably also has implications for how the Catholic vote is going to play out in the 2024 election. Nevertheless, let us not lose sight of the big picture. Even in a hyperpolarized, deeply fragmented time in which the center cannot hold and things fall apart, a ideological and in some ways divisive pope can still command 75% support from American Catholics. I think the surprise isn't that we are divided. I think the miracle is that we're not more divided than this poll suggests we actually are. Finally, this week, banned in Kinshasa. So Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo, who was the Archbishop of Kinshasa and also the president of the African Bishops Conference, SACOM, recently was on his way to Rome this past week for the C9 meeting. That's the meeting of the Pope's Council of Cardinal Advisors. But when he got to the airport in Kinshasa, traveling on his Vatican diplomatic passport, to which cardinals are entitled, it turned out that officials at the airport did not extend the courtesies to which that such a passport and, the, and his status are supposed to entitle him. Among other things, he was refused access to the VIP lounge at the Kinshasa airport. Now, if we wanted to, we could be a little ironic about this. Ambongo is a member of the Capuchin Franciscans too. One thing I know about the Franciscans is that they're not supposed to be living high on the hog, right? They take their vows of poverty very seriously. So one imagines what well, upset Ambongo about this situation wasn't that he couldn't get into the VIP lounge so he could sip their signature cocktails and hit the sushi and taco bars that these places often provide to their first class passengers. But instead, it was the fact that the government was giving him a deliberate snub and this was after he had very publicly criticized the government during his Easter homily for, among other things, devoting a disproportionate share of public resources to upkeep of the political class rather than serving the common good, and also failures to provide security, particularly in Eastern Congo. So the concern here is that this may be the government sort of rather pettily lashing out at a figure that they consider to be a thorn in its side. Let's remember that Mbongo is not simply a big deal in African Catholicism, but on some people's handicapping list, he's also considered a plausible candidate to be the next pope himself. So if it turns out that he gets enmeshed in a burgeoning church-state controversy in his own homeland, 
that could have consequences not simply for Congolese politics, but for Catholic politics everywhere. Obviously, we will have our eyes on the story. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you, as ever, for being with us. I will be back here, same bat time, same bat channel, one week from today. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed seven days. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you again very, very soon.